Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to part two of our L'Chaim Roundtable as we take a look back at the major Jewish events of 2014 and look forward to the new year 2015. And once again, I'm joined by a wonderful panel. Let me introduce them to you once again. Dr. Stephen Baim, who's the director of the Contemporary Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee and their Kuppelman Institute on American Jewish-Israeli Relations. Rabbi Eric Yaffe is immediate past president of the Union for Reform Judaism, and currently Eric is a columnist appearing in the Huffington Post, Haaretz, and the Jerusalem Post. And you can also read Eric's pieces at ericyaffe.com. Betty Ehrenberg is the executive director of the World Jewish Congress of North America, and one who's been of service to the Jewish community in many positions of leadership. And Micah Halpern, a syndicated columnist who lectures extensively on matters involving the Middle East and on terrorism. And you can read Micah's blog online, The Micah Report. And of course, you can also see Micah every week here on JBS, hosting his own Thinking Out Loud. And once again, I thank you all for joining me to discuss the year gone by and the year that we're about to begin. There was the unfortunate scandal of an Orthodox rabbi who basically was spying on women in the mikveh. And a woman obviously becomes naked and goes into the mikveh, and he was, he, had, he worked out a way where he was spying on them. And it received a lot of attention in the Jewish press. I'm asking you two questions. Number one, in your own minds on a scale of one to ten, how significant an event was that? And I'm asking you at the same time, to if you know, if I were talking to you every day and I said to you, Betty, is this something that belongs on JBS? Mike, does this belong on JBS? Steve, Eric, does it belong on JBS? And what I mean by that is, to what extent does this rise in your mind to an issue that should be given public attention in the media? But Steve Bame, I want to begin with you. What does the scandal mean to you, and and where do you rank it in terms of importance? Look, in terms of its salaciousness, I don't really attach all that much importance to it. Not, it's, obviously, it's a scandal, and we have very little tolerance for it. We shouldn't. But I don't think it's a, hardly, it's a major communal issue because of its salaciousness. What is important, I think, are two other things. Um, number one is that conversion to Judaism is a major issue for American Jewry. It's the best outcome to a mixed marriage, and it's certainly something we want to encourage. Uh, here was the man who was in charge of heading up the conversion processes to the Rabbinical Council of America. He enhanced For the Rabbinical Council of America, right. which is a formal organization of Orthodox, of, of the Orthodox rabbis. Rabbinate. He enhanced those standards, in my mind, making them quite uh, unrealistic in many ways, and certainly was disenfranchising uh, a large number of people who might have been willing to convert, oftentimes in conjunction with marriage, and he essentially was saying, no, we don't allow that. He was making them more onerous. That's right. So on the one hand, you have this man who is guilty of a, a very salacious scandal in the context of potential converts to Judaism. And on the other hand, he himself is responsible for enhancing those standards to the point of being unrealistic and overly onerous. That to me is the communal issue. Personally, I feel a little betrayed that I invited him to address a, a, a meeting of the Koppelman Institute on the question of conversion. He managed to alienate everyone in the audience, which ranged from the right-wing Orthodox to the, to, uh, to the left-wing of reform. Uh, so in that respect, I said, this is what the Orthodox rabbinate has done in terms of creating a model of leadership. Uh, so in that sense, I'm personally disappointed. But that said, um, I, don't, I think it's important for JBS and for other, other media organs to focus on it only to the extent that it, what it says about communal issues. Uh, the extent of our, our interest in it being salacious or voyeuristic, mm -hmm. no, that's for the yellow press. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're a rabbi, you hated the reform movement. What's your answer? Rabbis remain our most important communal leaders. I want to suggest that. That's certainly my view. I think that's the reality in the community. 
And uh, this was a misuse of rabbinic authority, a violation of rabbinic trust. Uh, so for me, this is hugely important. It reflects on our Jewish tradition. It reflects on the actions of every single rabbi. I was implicated in what he did. Uh, it was outrageous beyond words. And I, I, I believe whatever may have led up to it, all elements of the community understand that. But is that a concern and is therefore that a story? Yes, it absolutely is. And um, when our leaders are guilty of moral sins of this magnitude, we have responsibility to focus on them and to tell that story, just as we expect others to do so. And for me, the, the, I mean, the Orthodox authorities will deal with this you know, within their own context. Whatever mistakes they've made, I believe they're doing so now. I mean, to me, the broader issue here has to do with the question of the, the role of women in our community. The role of women in, in the religious world and in, in the broader community. Seems to me there are many, many such concerns that we have on our agenda now. Other issues during the course of the year that pointed to, to these particular issues. And, you know, be happy to discuss that if we have time. Okay. Micah, what do you think? I think there's a real serious question we have to ask, and I'm glad you're asking it. Is it worthy of coverage? Uh, and the first thing I, I need to say is, um, yes, it is worthy, but not because of that particular moral, ethical sin, let's say, for instance, or legal violation. Because uh, it's essential that the media be the watchdog for the people it represents. And if the leadership believes that they can get away with things without being held accountable for it, either by their professional groups, which, uh, which drop the ball with regard to the question of this particular rabbi, or the general secular community, it's a problem. The Jewish media must hold them accountable. That is an essential component, regardless of what the violation is. In this particular case, um, the character is a serious and was always a seriously problematic personality. There's no question about that. But that has to be ferreted out. We need to say, our leadership, we need to demand our leadership hold certain standards. And not the standards of everyone. The standards of our Jewish leadership is different. And that includes financial issues, it includes sexual issues, it includes relationship issues, it includes tzedakah questions, all of these things. They need to be contributors more. They need to be involved more. They need to hold up a standard which is dramatically different because they are Jewish leaders. That, by the way, is not just rabbinic leaders. It's also other uh, 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 Jewish leaders. And I think the Jewish community needs to know about it, and we need to talk more about it. By the way, I was disappointed that most of the discussion was about the voyeuristic elements of this story, which are far less interesting to me. I don't really care about that. I care about the abuse of power, and that's important. I didn't see anybody write about the abuse of power. That's my I point. I only saw the voyeuristic piece. And that's deeply disturbing to me. And that's why I'm glad we're talking about this, which gives me the opportunity to talk. Very good. <laughs> Betty? No, I think I agree with what's been said. Uh, I, uh, this was a leader, this was a rabbi, this was uh, a moral failure. It was deeply disturbing to me uh, because of not only the women's aspect, but also the conversion. I mean, converts are sensitive and delicate. Uh, people at, an, at a momentous time in their lives. It's, this is, was a real chilul Hashem, as they say. And um, <clears throat> uh, I guess I would have liked one or two articles less in the media because of the salacious coverage, uh, maybe because I, as an Orthodox Jew, also felt deeply embarrassed by this. Um, and uh, uh, I think we need to think about the Jewish community, Jewish leaders. I, I, just, I agree with what's okay. been said. Um, do you think, by the way, this is a widespread problem? Rabbis spying on women in the mikveh? No, I don't think it's a widespread problem. Do you, problem. Micah? Uh, no, again, I'm not into that issue. I, I just uh, want to I know. I think there is yes a problem no. of Jewish leadership. Do you think this <laughs> is a widespread problem of men, rabbis, spying on women in the Absolutely mikveh? Absolutely not. Do you think it's a widespread problem? Not at all. I believe that this was an isolated case of a sick man and that when you put it in the media or you put it on television or you run it on the front page of the Jewish Week on the forward, it gives a totally wrong impression about what Jewish life is, what rabbis are, what the Orthodox movement is, what conversion is like. Inside the Jewish community, there has to be serious reaction and serious concern. 
I am very reluctant to put something like this on television because I don't believe the viewer will be able to put it in perspective. I didn't like the way it was handled in the press. It's inappropriate. I like your word. It's outrageous. At the same time, it does not represent Jewish life. It doesn't represent orthodoxy. It doesn't represent the conversion process. I don't consider this to be worthy of time on a major Jew, the major Jewish television channel in America when there are so many other issues that are not about some outrageous act of an individual. I, the I newspaper think you're wrong. is wrong to cover it? The Jewish newspapers? The Jewish I week? I'll t I will uh, tell you this. I believe, I believe that Mike could put his finger on it. That the way the story was couched was an attempt to tit titillate. And that bothered me. I don't consider that to be responsible Jewish journalism. I don't. To me, there are two very substantive issues mm -hmm. here that have nothing to do with, I can't say nothing to do with, with the salaciousness, but it are peripheral to the salaciousness. One is that, uh, yes, we're interested in Orthodox conversion. Um, I think because, uh, number one, we can talk about the Pew study, the ascending importance of Orthodoxy in American Jewry generally. And here was a figure who was personally responsible for heading up the major commission on what Orthodox conversion means and is responsible for all of these slings and arrows, if you will, that have been thrown at it. And that's something I really want to discuss and think should be discussed. Yes, but that's a different discussion. That would have been interesting for you and me to have a discussion of that and to bring you on. And when you say it that way, I agree 100% with you. And I wish there had been a panel discussing what, the, what, can, what, is, is, what is Orthodox conversion today. But that's not the way this, the, what, what you just described, it was not part of the discussion. The fact that you had this gentleman to a meeting that you invited, and he alienated everyone, you say from one extreme to the other, right. that's interesting to me. And that's a subject worthy of discussion in public, in the Jewish community. It's irrelevant that this individual also happens to be a creep. It's irrelevant to the issue you've just raised. He was, it was a power okay. issue. He was asking things, he was asking them to do things, whether it be in the library, whether it be here, doing uh, rudimentary and ridiculous things, having nothing to do, and, and, and uh, depending, making it dependent on his acceptance and their further continuation in his, in his um, conversion process. Asking them to do things absolutely okay. disconnected I understand. to that. I, um, I'm only saying that I believe that the very valid reason you wanted it discussed is not at all what was being discussed for days or weeks. But you could have covered it responsibly. In other words, you're trying to make distinctions that are hard to make. Yes. But if you felt that there was a need to cover it responsibly, that's the way you could have covered it. You're right. By not covering it at all, yeah. we raised the issue that people would think we're not, we're not holding our leaders responsible Absolutely. for their actions. And that, that, that's the problem on the other side. Okay. Well, I think you made the right decision given the fact that it was covered and recovered and recovered and repeated in the same ne negative way over and over so that there was, a, at least on my behalf, there was this reaction enough already. But we, uh, the, the easy example to give you is from time to time there are our colleagues mm. who just do irresponsible things and they do things that are sexually inappropriate and, and normally within the movement they are held responsible. Mm -hmm. Rarely do we go public with it because it's an individual who and the, the congregation takes care of it, the CCR takes care of it and there, that seems in some way to me to be appropriate. I don't know that you, you go public with every time an individual because Steve's point is, is, that, is that there was a policy, a reason to discuss this in terms of policy. I don't disagree with him there. Is there but, a but pattern or is there a broader issue? Those are the, that's right. and those I, are the questions and that's we want to be the, asking. What I saw raised in the, by the way the press covered this was, mm -hmm. oh, this is a problem with orthodoxy yes. in general. Yes. And that's not true. The four of you were unequivocal. You don't. It, it's not that, the, oh, we uncovered something like what's happened in the Catholic Church, that many priests were involved with homosexual behavior with children. That's not what this is. This is an isolated case, but the way it was discussed, the way it, it evolved, that's not the way it evolved in the Jewish community, I, and I didn't want to be a part I of that. I have to say, I w it was yeah. so outrageous, and I was so sickened by it, 
That can cut both ways. I you're acknowledge. Right. Oh, you're right. And I'm, it's a reason not to cover, but maybe it's a right. reason to and cover. I, and I'm being honest enough to say to you in this group and with our audience, I wanted to hear what the four of you had to say. Oh, I, I appreciate, appreciate that. I, I do. Well, Moving oh, on. Moving on. I want to go. Okay. <laughs> the controversy over the death of Klinghoffer. Betty, was it overdone? Was it appropriate? The, there was the, the, there's an opera, Death of Klinghoffer, which tries to show why the Palestinians would hijack a boat uh, and, and kill. Um, the fact that it was in a wheelchair to me is irrelevant. It just makes it even worse. But they, they shoot uh, an American Jew, 60 some 67, nine years old. They shoot him twice uh, in the chest, and then they throw him in his wheelchair overboard. And then there's a, a, uh, an opera done about not the murder of Cliff Klinghoffer, the death of Klinghoffer. And there were many in the Jewish community who were very upset about it, and there were some who felt that they were overdoing it. Where do you stand? No, I think it were, many people were upset and had the right to be upset. I think it was important that we saw, they knew, the Metropolitan Opera knew that this was not okay because they did agree to uh, cancel the simulcasts, which would have made it much, much worse. But then, if once you know it's not okay, then don't stage the opera. And that's what I felt. That's what uh, many people felt. It was important to have uh, political leaders on both sides of the aisle say so publicly, and they did. Um, it was uh, ill-timed, if, if to say the least, when um, right after the Gaza confrontation, right after those. Uh, and Although it was scheduled before that. That's true, but. Um, th this was in a time when people are very sensitive as to what's going on regarding it becoming acceptable to 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 uh, uh, express anti-Semitic opinions. So in a cultural institution such as the Metropolitan Opera, we felt that they had made a really bad mistake, a tragic mistake, and it wasn't helping things any at all. Michael? Look, there's a, um, a freedom in terms of cultural expression that people have. It was in terrible poor taste. Um, it was wrong for them to do it, but they have the ability to do it. The element is that the, the people who should judge them are the people who buy the tickets and go to the opera. And that, I think, um, uh, emerged as the, as the critical component. Uh, I think it's exciting that people talked about it. I think it was, uh, the dialogue is important. I think that it's important to recognize that art sometimes mimics the wrong side of the, th of the argument, that is, the, the heroes become the evil characters, and that's what we see in this particular case. And that's deeply disturbing, but that is art. Does it say anything about the larger way in which Israel and the Jewish people are being portrayed, especially within the artistic world and on the left? Of course. Of course. It says a lot about it. But again, the, uh, a, 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 one of the... Uh, uh, performers was an Israeli, actually, which is very interesting, who came out with a major interview about how the, uh, uh, about how the uh, opera actually portrays it in a more realistic fashion. Uh, realism is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about good versus evil. Mm -hmm. We're talking about creating evil characters and elevating them to the level of human. And we're taking about, talking about making the victim into something which is almost irrelevant. And that's a problem. From the moral point of view, that is a problem. What was your sense of it? I was angered by it, having read all the various articles, and that you know, remains my sort of dominant emotion. I had one moment of doubt. There was a very sort of thoughtful review done in the foreword afterwards uh, by somebody who had seen the show. I didn't read the libretto. I did not see the show. Um, who simply said, I was misled, that um, the, the message that was portrayed in the media was not, in fact, the message of the show. That there was an element of it there. It was a rather minor element, and it was overwhelmed by other dimensions of the show. Having read that, it left me a bit confused. <laughs> and about at this moment, that's about all that I, uh, I, I, you know, I feel I can reasonably say. Okay, you didn't see it yourself. No, I refused to see it. I, I thought it would be wrong to see it. <laughs> okay. I had no intention of lending my support to such an enterprise. Okay. And what did you think? <laughs> Look, I thought the decision to, uh, to uh, put it on was uh, uh, an unfortunate, ill-advised, even outrageous decision. It certainly was not sensitive to uh, the Jewish street uh, in terms of timing, in the context of terrorism. You know, to me, it was particularly outrageous. Um, 
I sort of did, was a bit on the cynical side in terms of um, what might be called the level of importance. Uh, first of all, uh, I've been going to operas since I was six, 16 or so. I can't recall an opera that has any, had any major impact on public opinion, one way or another. <laughs> um, so in, in that respect, I, I, my cynicism said, am I really going to lose sleep over this? Um, number two is that I also said operas happen to be a particularly uh, difficult genre in terms of evalu evaluating. You really do have to be there and look at the entire picture, look at the entire gestalt. And uh, in, that, in that sense, there are operas I've been to I frankly have not understood. And uh, I'm not sure it, too many other people would have understood them either, let alone people who've never seen them or uh, you know, read a review somewhere and quickly, quickly jump to conclusions. But my real point is, is the sense of a lack of balance often in Jewish communal discourse. Mm -hmm. Namely, what should we be getting, getting excited about? And in that respect, I would not have attached this a uh, significantly high level of discourse, no matter how ill-advised the Met was to have actually put it on. For the record, by the way, my understanding is the Met, that opera's been around for 20 years. It has been. Yeah. Okay, how come I've never heard a word about right. it until no, now? No, it's been staged before. It's a great uh, protest. Uh, the children, the daughters of Klinghoffer have spoken out against it very strongly. But it was, I think it's, it's a bigger... It's insensitive. But, there's, a, but good there's, good another, is there's another yeah. issue here in terms of... Uh, what about when art is misused or used to produce hateful messages? And I remember uh, it was very controversial when there was the exhibition. It was in New York City. Some, an artist uh, thought that his uh, commentary on, on religious beliefs was appropriately expressed by a cross uh, immersed in urine. And this was... Um, uh, re this was greeted with great uh, protest and anger. And the truth is, you have to think about also when someone else is using art or misusing art to say something in a way that really deeply uh, offends me um, or, or uh, uh, someone of another form. I did not hear anybody say the Met didn't have the right to put it on. No. I heard Perfect. that they said what you yeah. said. That right. Basically, yeah. it was just poor, poor taste. taste. Yeah, absolutely. And my own feeling was that I don't think at the moment there would have been an embrace of a, an opera that would have talked about the death of Goodman, Schwerner, Ch Schwerner and, and Cheney. Cheney. And it wasn't there. They didn't die. They were murdered in Mississippi. And Klinghoffer didn't die. He's murdered. He, was murdered he was murdered on the Achilles Laurel. And I, uh, my own feeling was it, it was in bad taste. At the same time, and this may anger some of the people who are watching, I did not feel it was appropriate for Jews to don a yellow star um, in their protest in front of the Met. I don't, it did not rise in my mind to that level. And, it, and I felt, again, it was something that the Jews should have said, this is inappropriate, but it wasn't the worst thing I've seen. And it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, uh, the coming of Nazi, Nazi Germany Absolutely. here in America. Uh, yeah. um, all right, another issue. So we saw the release of Alan Gross uh, after five years in Cuba. Uh, and at the same time, there are many people who believe that the imprisonment, the ongoing imprisonment of Jonathan Pollard is somehow totally inappropriate. And once again, it became an issue in 2014. And once again, the administration refused to do anything to permit Jonathan Pollard to leave jail. I'm curious to know from the four of you, to what extent do you believe Pollard is an issue of importance in the Jewish world? Eric, where do you stand on the Pollard issue? There's a broad consensus in the Jewish community. The time has come for Pollard to be released. The time has passed for Pollard to be released. Um, you know, it's, it's tragic that it hasn't happened without in any way excusing his actions. And uh, so I, I'm troubled by it. Nothing has changed. Um, and uh, I would hope the United States would be more responsive. Um, it might be that there's more the government of Israel can do in this regard. Um, but in any case, uh, let's, as we look to 2015, hope that, that we'll see his release then. Do you have any idea why administration after administration, even those that have had close ties with Jews in the Jewish world and have been very sympathetic to Israel and the Jewish causes, not one single administration, not Clinton, not Obama, not Bush, nobody has been, not Biden, has been willing to say, let him go. What do you, does it, it you know, you, you said when, we, we, when you read the forward story, it gave you pause. I'm wondering if it gives you any pause at all that 
there has been so unequivocal uh, unequivocal position within administration after administration that something about the Pollard affair okay, makes it I, impossible uh, to let him go. When I, when I was uh, serving in a position of communal leadership, I was involved in some very high-level briefings off the record, and I, I cannot speak to any of those issues. He signed a letter asking for his release. Um, but uh, He did? He did. With his, with his orthodox counterpart. But the point being is um, we heard serious discussion on the other side. Mm -hmm. In other words, it is not as if we sat down and we simply heard excuse making. Mm -hmm. We heard serious people with strong ties to the Jewish community, a real record saying there's some tough issues here and shared what those tough issues were in some very considerable detail. So the notion that this is a whim uh, is, is simply untrue. But, but I've, I've already, I think, even exceeded what I, was appropriate for me to say, and I'm not going to say anymore. Okay. Well, what was your sense? Well, first of all, as far as, uh, as, far as Eric's comments are concerned, yes, we've had those uh, similar discussions uh, with AJC leadership, and they uh, remain actually on position as saying that we, we take no position, per se, on Pollard. Um, AJC. You're yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, in other words, we didn't sign a letter asking for his release. Um, what I would say about the broader issue, though, is as follows. What did change in 2014 is that you had key members of former administrations, once deeply opposed to Pollard's release, saying he had suffered enough. Now, that does cause some change, at least in terms of perceptions. Um, number two, I think, is the, uh, there is, remains the larger question of um, uh, Pollard's issue of um, self-culpability. Self um, in other words, the question remains for many in the Jewish community is, what, did what he do? Is what he did right or wrong? There is a, lot, a real fear that Pollard would be seen as, as another Dreyfus. Now, a clear, unequivocal statement from Pollard himself that what I did was wrong, I paid my, I paid my penalty, I want to go on with my life, that's been missing so far. And in that respect, that sort of, again, gives me some pause. Um, I think thirdly, the, uh, uh, the larger issue is uh, what you alluded to earlier, is that uh, you're talking about a policy that has been articulated by successive administrations, both Democratic and Republican, both more friendly and both less friendly. I don't dismiss all those people as simply being anti-Semitic. Uh, I think those people have their own reasons, that, uh, they've, some of which they've said publicly, some of which they've not. Um, and in that respect, uh, I think AJC's decision not to be out front on this and that we take no position per se, I find that to be well advised. What do you think? I think your question is really very good. It, it's, it's, it's caused, uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that question. I don't know the answer to mm -hmm. it. I know it's been dealt with at the highest level. Shimon Peres came and pleaded on his behalf. Benjamin Netanyahu came and pleaded on his behalf. So did other prime ministers. Um, what I do know is that as long as he remains imprisoned, he, I Israel remains on the bad list. It's a bigger message. It's a bigger message that um, we can release uh, those who were convicted on spying for the former Soviet Union or other enemies of the United States. But if you do this, then this is worse. This is worse than anything, and it makes somehow keeps Israel, as I said, on the bad list. And this is really a problem. And that's why I think that not only has he suffered enough, um, it is definitely time for his release. And I really, uh, the time has passed, like Eric said, for his release. And I hope that in 2015 we see it. There's no doubt that I think you should get out now because he's done enough. That said, there are some important things with regard to uh, Pollard that are critical. At Y, the Y River Convention, the conference that was created, which was actually this whole, going back to our original discussion from uh, previously about the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. It was interesting. Netanyahu uh, was there. Uh, Clinton was the president at the time. Sharon was there, right? And um, Natan Sharansky was there. It was the eve of Sharansky's bat mitzvah of his daughter. He got on the plane, and this is very, very critical. He gets on the plane, and Pollard is part of the deal. He comes back to Israel in time for his daughter's bat mitzvah, and Pollard is removed from the deal. 
So it was very close at that point. That was a Clinton issue. Evidently, Weinberger got uh, uh, called in and, uh, and heavily suggested that this was not a good, good idea. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what you signed uh, a non-disclosure agreement about, Eric, but I can say that there is no question, no question, that uh, for the, from the Israeli-American point of view, there was spying that was done on the highest levels that Israel did not own up to, didn't own up to in serious ways. For years, they said he wasn't run by us. We didn't run that spy. Then they accepted it. But there were a lot of other things, and there were people that are still on the persona non grata list of the United States from Israel who were actually even members of Knesset that were not permitted to the Hanukkah party in Warsaw. And I was there to witness it because they were persona non grata and they could not step into American soil, into the U.S embassy there. That's an important element to realize, all connected to the same story. There's a lot there, but also it has to do with other things. Israel was ultimately entitled by treaty the information that Pollard actually gave, but it would have come a little later. But then Israel turned around and actually were schwitzing a little bit. Schwitzing, how do you translate schwitzing? Everyone knows what schwitzing is. They were bragging a little bit. And they actually turned over a lot of that information to some of uh, the United States' worst enemies, which would in this particular case be the Chinese. And there's where we have an interesting contact. You know, the sweetener deal for an arms deal coming between China and, the, uh, and Israel. So that was another reason why this was, uh, yeah. was torpedoed. I look at it, and I remember when it first happened, I said to myself, he seems to be receiving a sentence that is so out of whack with what spies who have done far worse for enemies, not allies, have uh, been given, and so that I have always felt there was something, something His sentence about was this. changed. I raised this personally. I wanted it to be said with the President of the United States. Which well, President? Obama. Okay. When, when uh, I... And uh, what did he say to you, when Eric? I stepped down as President, he came to... Uh, he was at our convention yeah. because of yeah. me, but he was coming to address our very large group. And I was contacted, and they asked me would I talk to him, and I said that I would, and I had a minute with him alone. And, uh, you raised I, the issue. I raised the issue. Well, now that you've told us that, you have to tell us what he said. This wasn't uh, off the record. Okay, what did he say? But uh, so I give a very, uh, you know, a brief summary. He obviously knew what the issue was. And, right, 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 right. This was in 2011. So he said, well, he appreciated it, and he, of course, would think about it, but it, it was a very complicated issue, and that was the heart of it. Yeah, all I know is uh, my reaction was, this is unfair. Over time, I've only said to myself, there has to be something more to this because too many people who I consider, as you said, both sides of the aisle, good people, are not willing to let him go. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's political shenanigans. I think there's something here that in some way Pollard did something that just went over a line and we don't know what it is. And maybe it is that he put people's lives in jeopardy in a way I'm suggesting that, that it's, it's, it was Israel that was the violation, not the Pollard. Pollard did what he did, but it's what Israel did with the information, I, I don't, which I was can't far believe greater. It. I, look, and I don't know. know All I know it. is it's more complicated than, than simply some Spine. Jew is being pick, taken advantage of. All right, I want to move on. Does anybody want to say anything about the effect of the midterm elections, which on the one hand brought the GOP a great deal of uh, power, and at the same time, Eric Cantor, who was slated to become the first Jewish Speaker of the House, was defeated in, in those same elections by a Tea Party candidate. But do you feel the midterm elections have any lasting effect on the Jewish community as we enter 2015, Stephen? Not overwhelmingly, no. I mean, uh, for the election was held was fought on domestic issues, as is rightfully the case. Uh, Congress and the Senate really are I won't say they're marginal players, but they're secondary players in terms of foreign policy issues, such as the Middle East. Um, no, I, I, don't, I thought you know, what was happening here was there was a great deal of discontent with the, uh, the existing administration and its policies, and they really should be asking themselves, uh, what should they be doing differently? But I do not see the election as any kind of barometer or test of, uh, say, the Middle East and policy of America. Anybody disagree? Okay, then we move on. What's the tone, do you think, of Jewish life in America? Where do you feel assimilation is at the moment, intermarriage? And by the way, you as, as the former head of the reform movement, you've seen many things happen in Israel, which if, if grouped together, looked like, looks like Israel 
took some steps to be more accommodating and more embracing of non-Orthodox Judaism. So one of the things I'd like the four of you to address right now is, how is Judaism both in America and in Israel being embraced and recognized? And to what extent is there a revival within the Orthodox movement while non-Orthodox Judaism is suffering a certain kind of diminution. And, and Eric, do you feel as you look at the Reform Movement now and as non-Orthodox Judaism, both Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, do you feel that in any way it has proven to be, I'm going to use a stark word here, has it in some way been a failure in that when you look at some of the, of the conclusions that come out of Pew, when you hear the arguments that are made within the Orthodox community is that ultimately the only way the Jewish future will be sustainable and, the, and where you find the greatest degree of vibrant, active Jewish participation tends to be in the more observant communities within the, on the American scene. And although there is a tremendous excitement in some aspects of the reform movement and the conservative movement, as movements as a whole, they do not at the moment as we enter 2015 seem to be the cutting edge any longer of Jewish life. <laughs> In Israel, there were some very modest gains over the course of the last two years. I considered that to be promising. Um, unlike what Betty had said previously, I think there is a chance they will be swept away in the next government because of the presence of the, Kar of the Karidim, and that's very distressing to me. Look, in terms of here, these things tend to be cyclical. Uh, right now, look, no, no one in his right mind would say that assimilation and intermarriage don't constitute challenges to American Jewry. Of course they do. Of course they do. Uh, I, I look at uh, reform and conservative Judaism. They are rethinking their, uh, their mission and their values. They are redoing their institutions. They're responding precisely and exactly as they should in this circumstances and these circumstances and I, I, I think what, what's happening there is generally speaking quite extraordinary. I think the picture in the Orthodox world is much more complicated than what you're talking about. Look, first of all, I wish success to Jews everywhere. Synagogues need to be strong. We need to be doing mitzvot. The reality in the Orthodox world is the, gr the great growth comes in, in the ultra-Orthodox side and the Haredi side, in the New York area in particular. Look at the Pew numbers. And uh, I think a, a community dominated uh, by uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jews as they're now constituted causes all kinds of challenges for all of us. Among the, the modern Orthodox, there is growth and vibrancy, although their numbers are much more modest, certainly as compared with the, the Haredim. So uh, we, we face a, a very difficult, complicated situation I'm optimistic, though, about the, the state of Jewish life today and uh, about its future. Stephen, this is part of what you do every day. So how do you, well, how do you read it? Eric and I it? have a longstanding uh, debate over, over these questions also. Um, the single greatest um, uh, downside to uh, what's, what's come out is what uh, Steve Cohen and others have called the shrinking Jewish middle. By the shrinking Jewish middle, they mean identified, active, conservative, reform Jews. That's the architectural backbone of the Jewish community. In other words, if you're looking at what the shape of American Judaism will look like 10, 15, 20 years down the road, as those two movements go, so will American Jewry go. And in that respect, the news coming out of Pew is simply not good. That's number one. Number two is that um, the difference between conservative and reform is quite, remains quite considerable, and you can't, you can't simply collapse the two. The intermarriage rate in the conservative movement today is the 39%, say, since the year 2000. Uh, two Jewish parents raise, raising their children conservative, the odds are two out of five that they'll marry out. In the reform movement, it's 82%. That's almost double, more than double. So in that respect, uh, if you talk about where that middle is, um, there are real grounds for concern, both in terms of the conservative reform movement, but amazingly, in, in, the, discussion, in the public discussion of it, Everyone has spoken about the shrinking Jewish middle in terms of conservative, where it's been sharp. In the reform movement, the discussion has been less pronounced. And that's the subject of, uh, of further analysis. There's also a question of what then is our attitude towards mixed marriage. 
Um, and look, we, I think we had our, our last discussion, uh, we, we had several, several months back, I think one of us mentioned, uh, the, uh, at the recent Union for Reform Judaism convent biennial, uh, the statement was made that uh, resistance to mixed marriage is futile. It's like arguing against gravity. Well, if leadership takes that position, that becomes surrender. You know, that becomes giving up. In other words, if we no longer encourage endogamy, then in, a, in essence becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in that respect, I'm disappointed with leadership response and reaction. As far as orthodoxy is concerned, you're quite, Eric is quite correct in saying the picture is much more complicated. Modern orthodoxy today is only 3% of American Jewry. So here it says, Liff was saying, the future of American Jewry is in the hands of modern orthodoxy. That's absolute nonsense, unfortunately in my book, but that's another matter. Uh, the real surprise of Pew is that ultra-orthodoxy has become double the percentage of modern orthodoxy. That's something, if you had asked me before 2013, I would have said it's probably two-thirds modern orthodox, one-third ultra-orthodox. The actual percentage is just the opposite, particularly because of the issue of birth rate and fertility. That, that forecasts a Jewish community in which, if you're looking at it, who are its most active members, what is the potential pool of Jewish communal activists on behalf of Jewish causes, the larger pool is going to come from the Orthodox ranks. That has enormous implications because it suggests, for example, the state of Israel, the cause of Israel, that it's not something that is universally shared by the vast body politic of American Jewry, but rather it's one particular sector, which is particularly outspoken on many of these questions in ways that American Jewry largely does not empathize with. So this, um, the real news coming out of Pew, on the one hand is the shrinking middle, the growth of the ends, meaning orthodoxy on the one hand and the so-called nuns or non-identified uh, non or non-expressive non of their Judaism on the other hand. The growth of those two ends, um, it suggests a Jewish community that will be on the one hand increasingly uh, assimilated, that we have real problems on that other end, the so-called nuns look much more assimilated than the shrinking middle. And on the other hand, a community that's dominated by orthodoxy, which often is out of touch with the, what I call the, the, the communal realities, the communal base of American Jewry. So how do you sleep at night? I don't. <laughs> First of all, I'm at a certain age where you end up waking up at all hours anyway. Um, that's, that's one problem. Um, but secondly, uh, this one of my, my critiques of, of American Jewish leadership is that we find it a lot easier to address external threats because it's always easier to say the problem is out there, it's elsewhere, it's Iran. Um, it's uh, anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, it's the college campus in the United States. On those are the issues, we can develop a certain communal consensus because we don't like those people for whatever reasons. Some of them, by the way, are very good people, especially <laughs> on the college campus, but that's another matter. Um, uh, we have an enormous difficulty addressing issues from within, partly because we are, di we are divided over what constitutes being a Jew, what constitutes Jewish identity. We have very, very significant conflicts of what are Jewish values, and frankly, we have not found ways of intercommunal cooperation on many of these issues, such as Jewish education. In other words, why is it that there's no wall-to-wall -wall coalition of reform, conservative, and orthodox leaders advocating more serious Jewish education, more affordable serious Jewish education? We don't have that. We're spending an awful lot of our time on these external threats because we can develop a communal consensus around them. I think that's a misdirection. But well, you've been saying that for years. I don't, I don't change my tune. No, no. It's, it's very important the way you say it. Micah, what do you think? I think it's important to begin by suggesting that um, uh, we live in the freest uh, experience in Jewish history in the United States. And one of the things that happened with the freedom of um, the emancipation of the Jews, starting in France and moving right along, is that um, that Judaism became another uh, commodity that can be purchased. And so people are free to choose. And it's a real scary reality because pre this, even in our parents' generation, where we were living free, they were living freely in the United States, let's say, there was still enough anti-Semitism to keep them within the Jewish world. It's not the case today. It's sort of interesting. So in the free market, people could choose to be Jewish or not. And those numbers are deeply, deeply troubling. There's because no they're choosing? Because they're choosing not to be. They're choosing not to be. They're choosing to opt out. Why do you think that is? Because other things are more interesting, or because their parents haven't taught them, or because Jewish educational environments have not made it exciting, or for that matter, 
they just have never been exposed to it. And as a result, it's just an option. And it's an option which is not drawing them in. And that is deeply, deeply troubling to me. And I've spent a lot of time since Pew, and I've actually evolved a little bit in my analysis of Pew. Uh, and we've talked about it a lot in this group. And I realize and recognize that there are some real issues. I see a major, major uh, failing in uh, the Jewish communal experience and Jewish educational experience, but also Jewish exposure. We have not exposed, and that's why this television network, by the way, is so important. Not because kids are watching this, but because adults are watching it who could potentially affect their kids, which is why, let's say, for instance, the PJ Pajama Project for, uh, in federations around the country is so important because it brings parents with their children and Jewish books so that they're teaching them at the youngest of age concepts of Judaism, just what, that they are Jewish, if nothing else. That, I think, is, a, is, is an approach, getting us somewhere closer so that we can be in the game. We're not in the game most of the time. We're not even playing. We're not even in the stadium. Do you when, sleep at night? I, well, I'm, I, I sleep about four hours in general because there are a lot of things to do. When I do fall asleep, sleep by the way, I sleep well. When I fall asleep, I sleep well because I finished and I could start in the morning. I have problems. I, look, I, I really believe that one of the greatest approaches, and Pew actually upholds this, one of the greatest approaches, the hooks to Jewish community and Jewish commitment, Jewish connectedness to young people is Israel. And as young people are less and less connected to Israel, they're less and less connected to their Judaism. And that's an issue that we have to deal with. So how worried are you? I'm deeply concerned. Mm -hmm. However, I also have tremendous faith. Uh, not just in, in God I have faith. That's a different issue that we can't discuss necessarily in the major dialogue. I really believe that there are great, great people on the horizon for leadership. And I hope that they'll uh, grab the mantle the way you grabbed it, the way you grabbed it, the way you grabbed it, and the way I grabbed it. Because I think that that's our option. Our yeah, option is the whole retirement. <laughs> we I said need, that to you today. We need to have that. <laughs> what, what's, what's your answer? I don't know that I have an answer. I know that I'm deeply disturbed, and I also lose sleep. And um, because young people don't know much about Judaism, um, um, there is very little in the way of Jewish education that is being effective enough. There are, we're so divided. Uh, I, I can even imagine a wall to wall Jewish communal response to Jewish education because those are the people who don't even talk to each other. Um, there is sometimes outreach on the part of ultra orthodox or very orthodox groups to non affiliated, but they're speaking another language. Uh, nevertheless, I think there should be outreach, but there would be nice if there would be outreach on many levels and in many, uh, as, in many venues. There is, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I share my, uh, Micha's uh, concern about um, lack of identification with Israel, but I think it's all part of it. And I think the answer is still, again, you have to have parents who really care enough to give it to their children, because if not, then we will be lost. What does it mean, give it to their children? To affiliate. However you affiliate, whether it's with a synagogue, whatever stream it is. Whether and you don't think Jews are doing that now? No, they're not doing it. So it's not about children. It's about what you talked about. It's really, all of you have said it. It has much more to do with older Jews than children. The fact, what you're well, the fault what you're lies really with, with, with our older generations who, for whatever reason, have neglected the education of the children, which is something that we've all been talking about for years. Um, uh, there are f I don't idealize the Jewish education of the past. And I grew up in situations, where I remember the kids I was with. Mm -hmm. They all hated it. And this was even before day schools became, at a given point, there was a real movement that brought day school education and then there was even day schools in the Reform and Conservative movement, let alone the Orthodox movement. But I just sometimes think that there's an over-romanticization of what it's not a matter of romanticization or, or, or used to be. It's not about that. It, it never was enough and right. it never was adequate. But right. the point is you had it and there was, there was an emphasis, um, uh, there was a generational emphasis that this was important and it had to be continued. Okay, I, I, I'll, this is the story that stays with me all the time. I heard it when Michael Oren was speaking at a Birthright Israel celebration. And he got, he got up and he told his story. His story, by the way, was when he became bar mitzvah, he read transliterated Hebrew in English. And of course now he just became a major Jewish historian, became ambassador for Israel to the state of Israel, uh, to the United States for the state of Israel. He said the following thing. He said, when I was a kid, 
I came down one morning in 1967 to my father's, to the kitchen table, and my father holds up Life magazine with the picture of the Israeli soldier carrying the, um, the Egyptian rifle across the whatever body of water, Suez Canal or where it was, and he, Michael Oren says, my father showed me the picture of this Israeli boy, this young, young Israeli, and he kissed the picture that was the cover of, of Life magazine, Life magazine. And he, he Mike, uh, Michael Lawrence said, I wanted to be that boy. Then he said, I went to school at a time when I got beat up because I was a Jew. And he said, what moved me enormously was the experience fighting for the rescue of Soviet Jewry. So this personal anti-Semitism, the Six-Day War, and Soviet Jewry that moved Michael Oren from a Jew who became bar mitzvah with a transliterated English Hebrew writing to becoming ambassador for the State of Israel to the United States. And my concern is, what's the equivalent, not of Jewish education, but of Jewish experience? Look, we, we what, what, are we, what do our kids experience? And what do the, what you call the, you know, the adults who are no longer involved as your parents were involved? What drives them? What drives the experience of a Jewish family that is communicated to children in unspoken ways all the time that creates Jewish identity? I'm sorry to interrupt I, you. I, I just, I think we know what the building blocks are of Jewish education. We know what works. I agree with you, by the way. Let's not romanticize. You go back 20 or 30 years, you say, what's your worst Jewish experience? Overwhelmingly, it's Hebrew school overwhelmingly we turn people off and turn them away but there are certain things that we you know the fact that we don't have a community-wide program that assures Jewish educational components to every single child is in fact a disgrace and it has to do with all kinds of things since you know Steve mentioned them why can't we work on this uh, together Jewish nursery schools work Jewish camps work Jewish camps are hugely successive successful in building Jewish identity and generating Jewish excitement. Uh, Jewish youth movements, greatly neglected, making a very modest comeback, work reasonably well. Day schools, absolutely, mostly for the Orthodox, generally speaking, beyond the means for the masses of, of American Jews. Israel programs, hugely successful, hugely successful. And supplementary school is a mixed, is a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. If we could concentrate on those components of educating our children and assuring that they, they were available to every Jewish child and promoting it in a birthright kind of way, would it make a difference? The answer is absolutely it would make a difference. Absolutely it would make a difference. That's our challenge. Q was released in October of 2013. What should have happened in the last 12 months should have been an atmospheric of crisis among Jewish leadership. And instead of that, what we got were very different reactions. There, are the, there were those, and there continue to be those, who say Pew isn't so bad. We're doing OK. Uh, that's the whole group, a whole, whole school coming in, in terms of that. More widespread is the view of um, Pew is right, but um, we have more important things to worry about, um, or at least things that we can actually do something about, like the image of Israel and American culture. Um, third reaction, which is rarely stated, which is quite real, uh, is um, serious Jewish continuity is going to require sacrifices that we're not prepared to make. By sacrifice, they don't mean financial sacrifices. They mean <laughs> the degree of involvement and engagement. Uh, I gave a lecture not, not long ago to a, a group of uh, AJC leaders where uh, a gentleman came up, a man of enormous means. Uh, he said, you know, I heard everything you said. You're absolutely correct. I have to tell you, my wife and I are simply not prepared to make the kinds of sacrifices necessary to secure Jewish continuity. So in effect, what's happened here, which is so disappointing about 2014, is that we do know everything that Eric has said. We do know all the facts of Pew. Some choose to ignore the facts, and that's the problem of illusions. Mm -hmm. Others come up with rationalizations of why we can't do it. But I think the most widespread, the, mo the, real, the real response is that American Jewry, which, where it is today, is prepared to say, we'll do anything for Israel, but we will not make changes in how we go about our Jewish identification, 
and Jewish involvement. Because? Um, partly it's that uh, the attractions of America are simply too, uh, too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Partly because this Jewish engagement requires an awful lot of work. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not something that comes so naturally and so easily. Mm -hmm. um, to take the, tran the transformation of Michael Oren, to go from reading transliterated Hebrew to reading Hebrew without vowels, uh, that is an enormous transformation. Most people are not prepared to make that kind of change. So in that respect, I think what's disappointing to me is that um, we have not discovered the, uh, the value of why leading a Jewish life may be worthwhile. A word of optimism, just sure. a word of optimism. And I don't know that you necessarily disagreed based on your earlier comments. What gives me hope and what enables me to sleep at night <laughs> is the fact that we do have an educated elite. The middle that you talked about is the problem. Yeah. You have the, the, the unaffiliated, many of whom may be lost, and you have a, a, an apathetic middle. You have a Jewish elite in all movements, by the way, in all movements, who have a degree of commitment that we would have thought unimaginable, impossible, going back only 25 years. And I see this in synagogue after synagogue, in community after community throughout the country. They're not enough. Building a bridge from them to others is the great challenge. If we don't succeed, we're going to be lost. But the fact that we have this committed core is what gives me hope. That's nice. So I want to ask you where you feel the Jewish community is in terms of its, you know, you, you, know, you talked about the issue of has the Jewish community sort of decided it will give up on the question of opposing intermarriage. But a lot of people who write me and a lot of people who, who I speak with they are committed to the notion that the Jewish community is going to survive by outreach and that the intermarried couple is becoming a staple of synagogue life, especially outside of New York. In New York, too. But I have people writing me from all over the country who are trying to say to me, understand what our congregation looks like and what our community looks like. It is made up a very, very, very high percentage of intermarried families where one person has not converted. And synagogues are struggling, Eric, with the question of how do you, in, how do you in, embrace the non-Jewish partner? Does the non-Jewish partner become a, a member? Does the non, can the non-Jewish partner become an officer of a synagogue? Do you involve the non-Jewish partner in ritual? Do, you know, when you're called up to light the Friday night candles and say the bracha, does the non-Jew go with the, the Jew? Does the non-Jew get to come up to the Torah? These are questions that, out, that in many synagogues across the country are the real day-to-day -day issues. In addition, there has been now an overlay of a strong movement in the Jewish community to embrace gay Jews. And that to say that we've reached a point where there should be no distinction in the Jewish, in the synagogue, between straight couples and gay couples. And there's questions now as to should rabbis be Messiah their Kedushin at the, the, the wedding of people of the same sex, two men or two women. And it's not about creating an alternative ceremony for them, they're getting married within a certain kind of Jewish structure and how do we incorporate them. And there was a, and a headline in Haaretz which asked the question, is Charlotte Mezvinsky a Jew or not? Do you know who Charlotte? Chelsea Clinton. Yes. This is Chelsea Clinton's daughter. Chelsea Clinton marries a Jew by the name of Ms. Mezvinsky. They have a child. The name is, is Char Charlotte. She is not Jewish. She did not convert. Chelsea did not convert, although she marries a Jew. And the question is, is she a Jew or not? And it's not simply a matter of patrilineal descent. It's a matter now of how does the Jewish community in, uh, deal with, embrace, incorporate into life the non-Jew and the child born of a Jew and a non-Jew who's part of a synagogue community. As you look at Jewish life as we end 2014 and begin 2015, what, you know, what do you see and what do you hope for in terms of the way the Jewish community embraces now a phenomenon that is, is just now a reality of Jewish life? The reality is there are more and more synagogues with intermarried couples. Betty, I start with you. 
you know, you're an Orthodox Jew. Yes. <laughs> what do you want to do with this? What, what, would you, what would you advise the non-Orthodox world to do? And by the way, there are more and more Orthodox kids dating non-Jews. The non-Jew tends to convert, but there once was a time when Jewish children didn't date non-Jews. That's how there was no intermarriage in the Orthodox community. Now, Orthodox kids are dating non-Jews who then convert to get married. That is a major change within the Orthodox community as well. So anyway, I'm asking you, well, I think a, a, a 2014, 2015, where do you see this? I don't, uh, where do I see it? I mean, I think uh, it will not improve. Um, I think it, uh, you said the word convert, and that's the key word. I mean, once there is a conversion, then that, then, um, uh, then a person who is uh, converted uh, properly is accepted. Of course. And um, that's if if there is uh, an insistence on, on this kind of a marriage, then the non-Jewish uh, half of the couple has to convert. And I don't see another way around it. Um, I worry about the numbers in the sense of are there enough Jewish boys for all the Jewish girls? Are there enough Jewish girls for all the Jewish boys? And I would like to see intramarriage. But if there is going to be intermarriage, there has to be conversion, and I don't see another way around it. Michael, what do you say? I look at this very differently. Um, I look at it sociologically, not halachically, not patrilineally or, um, or uh, matrilineally. I know that we live in a free society, and so do our young people. So my argument is, if you want to join the Jewish community, I'm not going to stop you. I think these other issues are for other communities, uh, the community themselves, which other community choose to decide. If you want to join the reform community, you adhere to the reform principles. You want to uh, adhere to the, join the Orthodox community, you have to adhere to those. There's a community which is bigger than simply synagogue. Uh, much bigger, and that's how we have to view our Judaism, bigger than the synagogue, because synagogues are shrinking. They're shrinking for a lot of reasons, and one of them is because they don't meet the needs of our young adults, which is hugely important. So I look at it sociologically. I don't look at it halachically. Obviously, I have a halachic perspective, but that's a personal issue. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, as, a, as a Jewish leader. If you want to be Jewish, we want to embrace them. And it doesn't matter what form of Judaism it is. It doesn't matter if it's reform or reconstruction of Orthodox, or it doesn't matter if it's non-affiliate, it doesn't matter if you're a Zionist and that's your whole life of Judaism is your Zionism. Fine. I'm not putting up barriers to people joining Judaism anymore. Enough of that. Knock down the barriers. We have to expand this and we have to expand our entire environment and the way in which we receive them. Uh, we're too caught up in these little t teeny groups which are getting smaller and smaller and the nuns are becoming bigger and bigger and that's a problem. You want to join? Join. And I want to do everything we can to keep them in once they join. All right, I know you've spent years and years grappling with this. It's unfair to ask you on Al Regula Chat. But I, I just want the, you know, the, sort of the summary and the bottom line. Look, the summary is, first of all, equality for gays is a, is a reality for us and it's a value for us. And uh, if others make other choices, so be it. But in our movement, we have, have embraced this. Intermarried couples, our position is invite them in, embrace them, welcome them, foster identification and observance, encourage conversion wherever possible. Okay. This is your life's work. I want to know your position. Well, the way Eric has just presented it, I would simply say amen and say if that's the position of the reform movement, sign me up as well. I regrettably don't find that to be the position of the Jewish community. Um, in what way? In several ways. Um, number one is that um, with all of the, uh, the language of outreach, and the language clearly has changed, um, the uh, realities on the ground are that most mixed married couples, the overwhelming majority of them, are simply disinterested. Yes, but we're talking about those that are interested enough to become part of a synagogue life. Yes, there, there is a minority of mixed marrieds, you might call them even the positive mixed marrieds, or the pockets of energy among mixed marrieds, that do need to be encouraged. And because they are willing to take the steps forward, embrace them, do exactly what Eric has said, and that's, uh, that is the positive step. But that is not going to shape the Jewish community of the future. Yes, but it's I, a minority. I, yes, but I, the way I phrased the question, what I wanted yeah. you to speak about was, 
what should be the position of the synagogue community. Okay. And you know, I, I'm going to remind you, the issues are, can somebody who's non-Jewish be a member? Can somebody not Jewish be an officer? Can somebody not Jewish participate in the ritual life of the synagogue? Yeah. The uh, issue of participation and membership, I regard, largely speaking, as non-issues, unless the person's not Jewish. You know, in other words, that, they're not uh, Jewish. They're not Jewish. I don't see how a synagogue itself can suddenly become a uh, uh, a haven for non-Jews to participate and to enjoy uh, you know equal equal positions, especially on leadership levels. In other words, the idea that the president of the synagogue is a non-Jew, I find that reprehensible. Okay. I just want to, uh, okay. I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing. Okay. I just want to make sure that you're given the okay. intent. To, hold on. Okay. I'll give you a situation. You tell me what a synagogue. When your opinion, a synagogue should do with it. There is a couple, Jewish man, non-Jewish woman. The non-Jewish woman, although she's not Jewish, is terribly committed to helping her children become Jewish. She's the one who gets them to, quote, religious school, Talmud Torah, whatever it is. She's in the synagogue all the time. She likes to serve. And then somebody says uh, she's a teacher and she wants to be on the, the education committee of the synagogue. And she's not Jewish. Does that woman belong on the education committee of the synagogue where her child is studying and where she cares about the Jewish future of her child even though she's not Jewish? I think that's the, exactly the paradox you run yourself into, that uh, once you open up the doors that widely, what you will end up is being unable to make any distinction, any differentiation between those who have opted to join the Jewish community, the converts to Judaism, those are the ones that we really cherish, and those who basically, as good as they are in terms of wanting to participate, and we welcome that participation. But we also have to say there have to be boundaries and limits. Okay, do you agree on this? Because this is, this is the tachlis here. Well, first of all, do I agree there should be boundaries and limits? Yes. Where those lines should be will vary from synagogue to synagogue. I mean, the, the, the notion that you open the door and all is lost, I would suggest is wrong. What we have found in our synagogues is they struggle with exactly this issue. Mm -hmm. They draw lines in very sensible places, most cases that I disagree with, sometimes that I don't. But the, the autonomous reality of synagogue life has led to a very creative and positive I approach know, to I'm, these I'm questions. I'm asking you if somebody, if the synagogue called you up and said, Eric, we've got a, a question about what we should do with this lovely woman. She's not Jewish, but she's involved in the religious school and she wants to be on the education committee. I mean, I, you're being a journalist here. I mean, look. Maybe she. But this is a legitimate question. It this is a real. legitimate real. question, but yes and no. This in other is words, real. In synagogue, this is reality, real. This is a right, real is case. Real. Is she organizing, you know, refreshments for Sunday school on Sunday morning, or is she participating in serious Jewish discussions about uh, how we teach Torah on mm -hmm. the seventh grade level? Uh, I mean, that's the problem with the question. I, 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 I don't know. She's the latter. Now, what do you do with her? I think it's a problem. I think it's a manifest incongruity for somebody who does not identify with Judaism to be involved in the heart of Jewish educational and ritual okay. questions. So you would say that in this Most case, she doesn't belong on the committee. She, doesn't, she certainly doesn't belong doing those things that I mentioned. Uh, if the committee involves uh, organizing room parents, so then I don't have a. I understand. Then I don't have a problem. Okay. So in that way, you would agree. I with said before. I thought it was. I thought. Right. It, I thought the the official position of the reform movement, which I see as being a threefold position. I am not. I am not giving the official okay. position of the reform movement. <laughs> I want to say I did it one time, but I am okay. no longer in, okay. in uh, it's uh, the extent that, that the position is encouraging in marriage, encouraging conversion and encouraging intermarried parents to raise Jewish children who are committed to leading a Jewish life. All that is the appropriate role of the synagogue. My fear, and this is why I say I agreed with Eric to some extent in principle, I regrettably don't see the practice. My fear is, is that as outreach has become the, the official policy uh, of synagogues, we tend to become, here I'm just quoting Eric, frankly, from a previous incarnation, we tend to become more neutral on the question of conversion. And, perhaps even more depressingly, we tend to become silent on the issue of endogamy. My point would be in terms of forecasting the future is that um, to the extent that we can involve mixed marrieds to raise Jewish children and become involved, we should be encouraging. But we also need to recognize that the future elite that Eric sees as being so critical to the Jewish uh, communal endeavor, that future elite is not likely to come 
if there's been no conversion. In other words, it's going to come from people who are choosing Jewish spouses or choosing to become Jewish. And in that respect, I think the, uh, the focus on mixed marriage and outreach to mixed marriages should never be allowed to overwhelm the two other faux side points of endogamy in marriage, encouraging marriage to other Jews, and conversion to Judaism. I understand. Very well said. Can I also assume from what you've said, you would be uncomfortable with rabbis participating in intermarriages? A rabbi participating in civil service is very different from a rabbi officiating at a Jewish service, per se. And in that respect, I'd say what the question is, what is he actually doing there, per se? Is he trying to give this a, uh, some kind of a Jewish veneer, or is he trying to um, uh, equate both, both faiths? Why and is that, this hard for you to answer? Why is it hard for me to answer? Yeah. Uh, I realize the reality of mixed marriage is enormous. Yes. I think that mixed married couples will inevitably turn to rabbis to officiate. Yes, and what do you want the rabbi to say when they turn to the rabbi? I prefer the conservative answer, which is current, which is that of, I cannot do it. I welcome you into the synagogue. I'd like you to, to join, but do I have some respect for my principles, which is that of, as a Jewish communal official, as a rabbi, I cannot be the one blessing this marriage. Would you say the same thing? Well, I personally do not do intermarriages. intermarriages. I respect my colleagues who use it as an opportunity to encourage serious education, identification, and learning over an extended period prior to the wedding to make it that, more, that much more likely that they'll identify with the synagogue and the community after the wedding. So there, look, there are some rabbis who will marry without conditions, and I find that to be deeply problematic, but there are many rabbis who set serious conditions, and I respect that position, although it hasn't been my personal position. But I wanted a, a simpler answer for our audience. <laughs> do you have any advice for rabbis here? His advice is don't do it. Is your advice don't do it? When I give advice on this, I, give it a, I, I say what I just said to you before. I describe the realities out there. And I'll that's, ask it that's the Why best that do I can it? Why do. Why don't you do it? Um, I mean, you are, you are as a, about as embracing of people as any rabbi on, in America, but you've chosen not to do it. Tell us why. Well, I mean, I, I, I didn't do it again because, I, to me, it was a manifest incongruity in terms of my perception of the rabbinic role. But what's different now is I was ordained in 1974. The reality in 2014 it's a different reality. And that's what we're talking about tonight. And in order to meet that reality, you have many more intermarried couples. Bringing them into our community is hugely important. An accepting and loving rabbinic voice who can help to bring them in and educate them and promote commitment and promote ultimately conversion. That might require doing things that I wasn't prepared to do and haven't been prepared to do. So if I were being ordained today, I would be struggling with this question. In a way that you weren't when you were In a were way ordained. that, well, first of all, it came up then as well. It's not as if it wasn't part. But then I fairly quickly came to, you know, resolved how, how I would uh, handle it. I think um, it wouldn't be so easy for me today. And exactly Very where honest. I would come out, Very honest. I'm not sure. Okay. Do you think it removes an incentive to convert to Judaism? Potentially. Well, that'd be of concern to me. In uh, that, you know, I think that is a legitimate concern. Although the truth is, and what I have found with, with converts to Judaism, they're divided. There are some who say specifically that. Why would anyone convert if you can do X, Y, and Z without conversion? On the other hand, that isn't the position of everybody. And conversions who are very, uh, converts who are very immersed in the community also say, let's be serious about it, but let's draw them in even if that means you know, doing things. But why is the poor though the synagogue? I don't understand why that is. I don't understand why, why uh, you're emphasizing the synagogue so dramatically in terms of these people's because approach and entree the problem into on it. Their hands. So most Jews are not entering Judaism via the synagogue. Then, they, um, then it's irrelevant. 
but rabbis are asked all the time. I, I understand that. And I want, want to know from both Steve and Eric, where do they stand on this? By the way, I will tell you, I will tell you, you, you all of you know who Barry Schrag is. Of course. Yeah. And Barry Schrag, for those who don't know, heads the Jewish Federation in Boston, is, a, is an Orthodox Jew, a very committed, passionate Jew. And I had the chance to talk to Barry Schrag about this subject at the GA this year, the General Assembly. And I asked Barry what his advice now is to American rabbis. And Bowie, you may have seen this already on JBS, so I'm not telling you anything you haven't been able to see. But for the four of you, and he will acknowledge this because he said it to me after, he, the, after the camera stopped rolling. I asked him the question, and a look comes across his face. The look of, oh my goodness, now I have to answer this question publicly. And Barry is a very honest guy. You all know him. And he said my position, but he basically has changed his position. And his, he, he now says, and he said, this is going to make people angry at me. It seems to me that we have done, we have not, there has not been a successful strategy for rabbis to say no. It's not that if a rabbi says no, the person won't, won't get married anyway, and very few of them convert. Usually if they're going to convert, it's not because there's a rabbi somewhere who says, I'll only marry you if you'll convert. I don't, boy, in all of my time, and I do not perform intermarriages, and I've had to say no to people I love very much. Nobody said, oh, well, I love you so much I'm going to convert now, or my spouse, is, my, my intended is going, to, is going to convert. They never do. They basically go and find somebody who will, who will marry them. And what Barry Schrag said was sort of something you said. There's been a, there's been an ev evolution here of what real life is in the Jewish world, and as we enter 2015, the reality is rabbis have to deal with this in a different way. And I believe the discussion, which began recently now with this conservative rabbi, who made a big deal of this. I believe that there is going to be, that your position, as much as I have lived your position and respect your position, the Jewish community is moving and there's a reality of Jewish life that is so large that it is, that it is you know, it's creating a reality of, of its own. It's, it reminds me of the Talmudic line, about, go see what the Jews are doing with the knife on Passover. Look at what Jews are doing and ultimately there may be a change. As far as, the, as far as Barry Schrag's re response goes, and here again, I love Barry, goes back, I go back with him many, many years, but um, what he's missing in his answer, which you've sort of echoed here, is that, sure, the realities on the ground have changed. Yes. The reason for opposition to mixed marriage, <coughs> and the reason why rabbis do not officiate, is not that they don't recognize those realities. Of course, they live in the same world you and I do, but they also say there are overriding issues of principle. Now, if we don't stand for those principles, then the, the practical effects is that endogamy will fall off the boards. Conversion is, more li is likely to fall off the boards. You'll always find people who are so committed to marrying a Jew, they will choose to marry a Jew. You'll find people who are so committed to conversion will convert regardless of whether the rabbi marries us or not. But you'll also find an awful lot of people who say, well, the rabbi said it was okay, so therefore it's okay. Now, that's my concern about the practical effects. The principle is one of what do we stand for as Jews? I don't see the, the kind of response that Barry Shray gave you is upholding that principle. We have to get you and Barry together. I'd and be delighted with that. And you'll have to put this, I mean, this is something that I believe, you know, you talk about what should the Jewish community be grappling with in a, in a forum like this. There may be no more important issue on the American Jewish community. Absolutely. Scene. And there's nothing you say I disagree with. And I think, but, but, but you know, it's the old, the line from Fiddler, you're right and you're right and you're right and you're right, but you all are right. So I'm, I asked you to just, is there a person of the year for you, Betty? As you look at 2014, is there one, Just one personality no, more than one. who comes up? Yeah, more than one. You can have more than one. Racheli Franco, the mother of um, one of the three kidnapped boys. Correct. Who was just amazing. Um, Scarlett And jo she moved you because? <sighs> she gave courage to everybody else. She, she gave comfort and courage to everybody else, and that was... Her son, Way Naftali, beyond. was taken. Yes. Well, um, Scarlett Johansson for bucking a huge system. She's one of the persons of the year for you, huh? Yes. Zaid, Zaidan Saif, the Druze, not Jewish, the Druze 
a policeman who tried to stop the murder, murder at uh, Harnov. Harnov. Very nice. All right, Micah, who's your person of the year? Well, the person of the year for time this year was not a person. It was actually the fighters of Ebola, the people who were fighting Ebola. In 1982, Time Magazine's person of the year was the computer, if you remember. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is the person of the year is actually uh, the, the Iron Dome. Uh. And uh, coupled with uh, people who manned the Iron Dome. So that would be the, uh, the people and the thing and of the year. And you say that because? Because that really was a, uh, a game changer. I mean, that really protected Israel in a way that we had not seen before. The technology was involved, but really created a situation where Israel was, by and large, protected from this evil force that was lobbying constantly rockets and missiles in order to destroy her and hurt as, invo uh, to truly create as much damage as possible. Israel protected itself through this Iron Dome. So I believe that the, uh, the people who created it, the people who manned it, and the dome itself, I think, is beautiful. Um, Eric Yaffe, what was your person of the year? In the Time Magazine sense, of the person who's had the most influence, positive or negative, I would say Sheldon Adelson. Interesting. Tell us why. Had an enormous impact, for good and not for good. Um, tremendous philanthropic uh, generosity. Um, sig very significant role in birthright. Uh, deeply problematic role uh, politically, both on uh, the, the secular political right in the United States, doing things that ultimately, as an American, I have problems with and I think have not been healthy for the Jewish community, and um, particularly problematic in Israel, which is really, in a, a, a very fundamental way, kind of distorted Israel's democratic system of government by circumventing their campaign contribution limitations. And, in a way that's, that's unhealthy for Israel's democracy. But uh, on a figure of outsized influence who has an impact on virtually every area of, uh, of uh, Jewish life. Okay, Steve, who's your person of the year? Well, if I were to follow uh, you know, Eric's guidelines or Time Magazine's guidelines about impact, uh, I would go back to the Prime Minister of Israel. There's no other figure that has been more impactful on the world Jewish scene, uh, especially obviously the state of Israel, the Jewish state, but also diaspora Jewry as well for different reasons than Bibi Netanyahu. Perhaps it's a new definition of the notion of from Zion shall come forth the Torah, you know, meaning that uh, it's the key person in Israel that's the person of the year. My personal choice would be something very different though. Um, the most meaningful Jewish experience I had this year, aside from appearing on your program occasionally, um, is, was a nine day conference at Oxford University this summer dedicated to the thought of Yitz Greenberg. Um, I walked into it and walked out of it saying, there's no finer Jewish thinker on the, on the scene who has the remarkable capacity of absorbing the best of modern culture with the best of traditional Judaism. So in that respect, I saw him and, and his work, it was a conference dedicated to his work, I saw him as really being personally the most impactful. And secondly, uh, a real prescription of what, it, what does it mean to be a modern Jew. That's lovely. All four of you gave wonderful answers. Um, well, my answer is the four of you. And uh, in all seriousness, and it's not like I don't think it's true for you, I probably would have had to say Benjamin Netanyahu uh, simply because of his role in Jewish life and how so much of our attention is turned towards Israel today and, and what he's doing. But I did not find an individual this year that was clear, clearly somehow made an impact that was that would earn that individual a unique status. Um, you know, you mentioned Yitz Greenberg, Avi Weiss, who has been a major rabbinic force in creating uh, a what he calls now open orthodoxy, not modern orthodoxy, and he's been one of the most involved Jewish activists on the scene. He is retiring, and he was honored this year, and I feel that Avi Weiss, who's been at every major moment of, of uh, Jewish concern, in, uh, as long as I've been aware, I give him a lot of credit. I also feel that Ari Shavit, 
was given an enormous amount of um, personal attention this year, the author of My Promised Land, which came out in 2013, but it was really in 2014. Every, you almost can't go now to a Jewish convention without Ari Shabit being there and being uh, a speaker there. And I also mention a man whom most people don't know, maybe the four of you do, a man named Sigmund Rolat. Sigmund Rolat is a Jew who, a survivor from Poland, who was instrumental in creating the Museum of Jewish History, or Polish Jews, in Warsaw, and has done remarkable work in trying to resurrect the connection of Polish Jewry to us as American Jews, and also tried to heal the relationship between Polish Jewry and Poland itself. And I'm not sure any one of them is any more... Uh, distinguish them than the ones that you've mentioned, but those are the people who come to my mind. I appreciate you enormously. And Mutual. Again, I, I, I never want this. I, never, I always want you in your chair. Micah, what you do for JBS, linking out loud, and what you're doing on the Jewish community is just marvelous, and it's always wonderful that you sit next to me and, and help me on this, uh, this, this Jewish journey that I'm on. Betty, I have you know, been a friend of yours for years and years and years, and Thank I just you for thr what you do. I thrill to what you do, and you're an important, important voice. And you, my dear friend, you and I have grown up together, and, and uh, there's no voice like you in the rabbinic scene, rabbinic America. And people agree with you, they disagree with you. You are always intelligent and passionate and insightful, and I appreciate you enormously as well. These are the four people who I had the what a, what a kick for me that I get to sit with these four individuals and share their thinking. As always, we invite you. We invite you to share with us any thoughts you may have on any of the things that our guests have had to say. Steve, Micah, Betty, and Eric, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. I wish every one of you the most wonderful, fulfilling, healthy 2015. And I really hope there are many, many times I get to sit with you. Kol tuva hatlacha to you. Until the next time, my friends, have a wonderful new year in 2015. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.